everyone! Hope you guys have had a super splendid week and weekend. First off, I do want to say that us here in St. Louis got pretty lucky with the storms that rolled through this week. The Charles S. Brown house survived quite well, including the tarp that's on the mansard roof right now, so everything's A-OK -okay here. But our heart goes out to those across the south and the Midwest uh, that got hit pretty heavy by these storms, lots of tornadoes. Which of course, for those of you outside of the U.S., spring is the time that this region of the United States, the central United States, gets hit pretty heavy um, by this type of weather, which for me, since I was a kid, was actually quite fascinated by. But when you have a house as old as this that uh, has as many little leaks and quirks about it as this place does, um, it does <laughs> get a bit scary. But I do have to say, it is the first time in a very long time I have seen a storm roll in that hard, that fast. So uh, definitely a, uh, a bit of a wonder to behold, I suppose.
we've finally got one of these windows back in complete done there are a few things i need to modify you might notice the gap at the bottom of the window is a bit bigger here and a bit bigger up there and actually this bottom bit here and the top up there do stick slightly which is kind of crazy because the center line is basically perfect um, but essentially the windows are perfectly square the frame was not and i was unaware of how unsquare the frame was so it's quite tricky to get these two sashes back in of course you also might notice that i'm missing the hardware that keeps this window shut and that's because all of the hardware for these casement windows down here in the basement i think out of the seven windows there are two matching pieces of hardware and of course they are the well, they're, they're not nice pieces. But overall, everything's looking quite nice. Then of course, there's the exterior elements as well. Might be difficult to see, but I did clean up the wood around the outside here. But there's still quite a bit of paint on the exterior that I did get off. Now, I would love to open it up and show you guys all of the beauty that is a magnificent opening window. Uh, but because there's nothing to grab onto, and it's warmer outside than it is inside they stay pretty closed <laughs> so uh, i don't have anything to grab onto and therefore i cannot get them open without walking outside and opening them and just to point out how much that window has changed here's the window that's just adjacent to it to the left of it and you can see just how messy and decayed and screwed up these things were and this window is actually better than the one over there or is better than the original condition of that one over there. Go back over to the other window. One is very clean <laughs> and fresh and, and it feels good. It... But yeah, very, very big difference between the two. And of course that means next week, this ends up being a very, very big project along with me getting back outside and repairing the rest of the woodwork that goes on the exterior of that window. While most of the paint wants to come off of this pretty easily, you could just kind of chip it off. Uh, I usually use a very stiff uh, putty knife or a razor blade, depending on how stubborn uh, the stuff is. Some of it though, it really likes to cling this paint. And so trying to get this back to base metal, that way you don't have all this crackly paint left all over it and you have a very nice clean look across the board and something that's very uniform, that takes a lot of patience. And you can kind of see a bit better here what I'm talking about with this crumbling paint. I've already been messing with this thing quite a bit, uh, just trying to get some of it cleaned up while I'm uh, working on other things. You just kind of come and pick at it. But it takes a lot to get this thing all finished up. And of course, rust free and, you know, functional. You also might have noticed the two paper towels I have on here. Odd little trick I heard about this week is that if you take that same rust remover that I've been using, the Evaporust, again, it is non-toxic, safe to touch, so it's not a problem for me to touch it. But I've heard you can soak paper towels in it and wrap it around a much larger object like this. Obviously, I don't have a giant tub to submerge this in the rust remover, nor do I want to go and buy that much rust remover. So I've heard you can soak paper towels and drape them over this and leave them for a day. And it does more or less the same thing. So I've got two little spots where I've done it. Hopefully these don't dry out by the morning. Uh, but I'll be very curious to see how this process works. Because the only other way I figure it out to get enough of the rust off to get a nice, good, concise paint job is to literally take a, a bit of sandpaper and kind of sand down to a certain point. So yeah. Iron gates, I gotta get used to them because uh, I've only done one of these so far and they do take quite a bit of time and I do have seven of these to fix on the bottom floor of the house. Also answer a question about last week's video, why didn't I go ahead and insulate behind this? Well, the main reason for it was airflow. When this house was built, these wooden walls did not exist. The whole beadboard and everything, this was added later. So these walls were never designed to have any kind of covering on them except for, except for maybe plaster. That being said, I see no evidence of plaster being anywhere on the walls down here. The ceilings, yes, they were completely plastered in. In fact, most of that plaster was still here when I bought the place. 
But these walls, they're designed to breathe. They're designed to let moisture in and out. So there's always going to be a moisture transfer from these walls to the exterior and vice versa. They're always going to do that. And so I feel like adding an extra element behind these walls might hold on to more of that moisture, which would then make these boards rot. I know a lot of people have more of a modern sensibility about how you build things, but you have to understand this wasn't designed with modern standards in mind. It just wasn't. When you use materials that aren't necessarily compatible with how this building was designed to be used, you run the risk of a lot of, well, problems. So I just didn't want to add an extra thing that A, could wick more water into the wood and leave a bit of an air gap. That way it can all breathe and function and allow transfer of things. Even if it's just in that little gap behind these, this wall that has that little bit of airflow, it's still better than nothing. So essentially that's my thought process with the whole thing. My original goal this week was actually to go and get some more beadboard and, you know, obviously wrap the walls in more beadboard. But of course, Buckhart's the place that I go and get this beadboard from, uh, didn't currently have any. So they're gonna be making some this week, so I'll have to drop by and go grab a, another load of that. But even though they didn't have beadboard, they did have something else I needed. So let me show you what I planned for trim down here since we talked about that last week as well. So here's what I've got. This is going to be for the surrounds of everything. And this I'm going to be using as a header above the door and as and as the lower bit that goes underneath the window. The name slips me right now, but usually under like, you know, Victorian windows, you'd have a little piece of trim that goes on the bottom part of the window, just underneath the sill. And I have this little kind of a bull nose piece here that I figured at the very top of the door because this is too thin for this to meet up with it, would look very nice attached to that. And then this has enough height to butt up against that. Okay, so obviously this isn't installed yet, but this is more or less what we're thinking for the trim down here. And you'll notice there's no plinth block down here. Plinth block being the block that goes at the very bottom of these things. A lot of Victorian houses have them, mine included. This house, or this part of the house though, course didn't have them because a this is the basement and b this is more arts and crafts the style down here than it is say Victorian of course that's because this work was done down here in the 20s in fact this is my long lost missing window this was never a door this is a was a window and it was converted to a door which is why even in construction and everything else this door is completely different than any other door in the house including the back door that's behind me here and oddly enough, the baseboard here, this is how they had it set up. The baseboard would run all the way over and the trim would set on top of it. And I only know that because this piece of baseboard ran all the way to the door. But the lines in this are very simple, rather, I guess, elegant, you could say. They're, you know, there's nothing really fancy going on here. It's not a terribly complicated cut, but I think it'll look just fine. And so if you can imagine that little bullnose piece, We'll sit up here and then that other piece of trim on top of that. I'm wondering if I should paint this a different color from the woodwork here or if I should go ahead and paint it the same color as the walls. Currently I'm leaning towards the same color as the walls because what other color would I go with this that would make it fit into this room? Uh, you know obviously we have the red presented in the doors um, but the only other color really present here at the moment is the black and I think that would look kind of funny black Especially against this color white with the yellow undertones, but you guys will have to let me know about that Also, the color of the sash is actually based on the color of paint That was the same color of paint that was on all the beadboard that was actually under this So I believe when the vet did go and initially, you know change up this room I believe he used this kind of off yellowy white for just about everything down here and I have to say it looks pretty good down here and it does look more clinical and clean like a vet office or a doctor's office would have probably looked like in the late teens early 20s I think that color makes sense for this part of the basement of course the rest of the windows in the basement I've already painted the one and I just went all of the dark green like you guys see on the outside of the windows 
Finally this week, these are the other two sashes you guys saw me work on this week. And I have to say, these sashes really had very, very minimal damage. As you can see on this one, I filled quite a bit. Really, that's the only big chunk that's missing out of this window at all. As you can see, there's very little filler anywhere. That's because these windows were almost in perfect condition, which is quite amazing. I will say, however, the reason I have these flipped on this side is I do want to point out one thing that's very important when you guys go to work on your own windows, if you go and work on your own windows, to look out for. I want you to pay very close attention to this line here and see how quite straight it is, which is what you want. You want a very straight line here. Uh, it doesn't matter as much here. Of course it does, but not as much as this. And the reason for that is when you go to glaze something, your glass sits on that ledge right there. But the glazing rises to this top edge right here. So I've got my glazing knife here. Let's pretend for a second that we've got a piece of glass here and we want to glaze this. So what you would do is you would rest this part of your blade against the glass and run it along that edge. And that would essentially cut it off at the top and you can clean that up with a little bit of sandpaper once the glazing skims over. Or you can take this and scrape it right off the top and it leaves you with a very clean edge here. Now on the exact same window, the other sash, which is this one here, has some pretty big issues. And you can kind of see them right away. You can see that really big, deep cut there, some little bulbous bits, and, and just bits that are rougher. And so, if I were to do the same thing with my glazing knife, again, pretending there's glass here, if I ran across that, the knife jumps and bumps, and every time you would do that, you would leave to a divot or a drop or a dent in your glazing, and therefore your finish wouldn't look very good. So these are things I'm gonna have to work to get out of this sash in particular with wood filler, because you want that clean, straight, flat edge across here. So this sash I'm gonna need a little bit of work on, even though it looks like it's in pretty good shape, because it is. But that is definitely one thing you have to think about before you go ahead and finish off your window. All right guys, that's gonna do it for this video this week. It's definitely a fun one for me. Really, really excited to get that window back in. It took a lot of fan dangling to get it in there right and I spent more time on it than I really thought I would. Uh, but even with the same task, there's always a different challenge to it here in this house and so, uh, uh, it always keeps you on your toes, you know, these projects. And there's a lot of creative puzzle solving, let's call it, that I have to do here at this house because the same task will require a way different type of, of solution. But that keeps it fun, it keeps it interesting, and it stops being very repetitive because it's always a different challenge. So as always, guys, thank you so, so very much for watching. Uh, your guys' support makes this all possible. And by support, I mean just simply watching these videos every week. So thank you so, so very much for being here. And I'll see you guys again next week. Bye-bye.